All right, hey, good morning, everybody. Sorry about all that. Uh, we're talking about uh, design and audio uh, early on in the process of design today. I'm Dren McDonald, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So um, we're running late now because of that problem. So a little bit about me. I was last audio director at uh, Loot Drop with John Romero and Brenda Brathwaite and uh, Tom Hall. Uh, very design-centric studio, so that was a, a great deal of fun working with, uh, with those people on those two titles. Before that, I was at uh, Six Ways Low Lab, so again, working with John and Brenda on Ravenwood Fair and Raven Sky City. And I've worked on other titles, such as Skulls of Shogun, which is coming out next month, which is on uh, all Microsoft platforms, uh, various other titles, other media. And before game industry, I was in the music industry doing that sort of thing. So let's move on. Why am I here? For the same reason you're here, because uh, I want to make fun games. And uh, for my discipline, I really feel like uh, I can help make a game a lot of fun by, uh, on the audio side. Um, and so I'm going to give you a few examples of how I feel that kind of integrates into the game design and really makes for a better game. If you just spend a few moments thinking about it beforehand. So we're going to start. Uh, with Star Wars, because kind of modern sound design really kind of begins with Ben Burtt and Star Wars and what was happening uh, with the first Star Wars movie. And I'm just going to use an example of how the, uh, the early iteration and integration of audio into Star Wars really uh, helped in particular with this character. Um, we all know R2 and we know uh, what he sounds like, but when they started on the film, uh, no one knew what any of these things were going to sound like. Of course, uh, Ben Burt went out and recorded a lot of source material, um, reading the script and whatnot. And then the first reel came in, and they made that film a little bit differently than you're going to make a film these days. They were getting it reel by reel by reel uh, as they would finish it, and Ben Burt would get the first reel and started putting his sounds to it. And um, he did the first reel, and all of a sudden, all the editors were hearing what R2 sounds like. We know what he sounds like. So a lot of uh, a, a lot of people, the whole staff on that film didn't know what he was going to sound like until they started hearing this. And all of a sudden, there's a bunch of personality in this little robot that they didn't know that was going to uh, be there. So because they got this early first real cut with the sound, all of a sudden, the editors are realizing, hey, we can start cutting more shots of R2 in this and make reaction shots and make uh, humor shots uh, and edit uh, more R2-D2 in there because they know that we're confident what the sounds were going to be and that it would elicit a reaction. So uh, I'm going to talk about that you know, in games now. And I'm going to use the first example is uh, Bastion. Um, and uh, many of you are probably familiar with Bastion. And uh, uh, the audio team on that was basically two guys, and they had um, very early involvement in that game. Um, if you go to gdcvault.com, you can see Darren Korb's, um, his talk from last year's GDC, where he talks extensively about how he was involved. It was his first game, but uh, the audio was successful because he had uh, early access. And you can see um, early builds of the game. He shows video of it where you have just placeholder art, and then you're hear, hearing some music that actually shipped with the game. He was influencing the tone of that game before a lot of the audio, or before a lot of the artwork was into that game. So uh, a lot of the uh, disciplines coming together at around the same time, or even audio informing some, what the artwork was going to be, uh, they had the opportunity to really work together and um, decide what, those, what the game was going to sound like and uh, affect the tone of the game. <clears throat> Another really great um, aspect of that game, if you've played it, is the narration. Um, if you haven't played it, there's a narrator in the game who um, comments on your, on your gameplay as you go through. So if you get, uh, get hit by a, by a bad guy and fall down, you know, the narrator will say, oh, the kid took a, took a fall this time. You know, you're constantly getting this commentary. And that probably wouldn't be part of the game design had it not been for um, getting involved early on between the designers and the audio folks um, kind of brainstorming. So I'm just going to show a little clip of this. This is at the beginning of the game, so if you haven't played it, no spoilers here. Um, but here's just a little clip of it. You can hear the narration. He sees what's left of the rippling wall. Years of work undone in an instant, in the calamity.
that a survivor? No, ma'am. It's a gas fella. Forced out from underground. Kid pops him good. Fella got a piece of him, though. So you hear that. They got a piece of him there when, you, when the player took some damage. The narrator's commenting on it. Uh, how many people have played Bastion here? Just curious. Okay, cool. It's a great game. Um, is there any way to turn up the volume of the PA? Do you know? Uh, I have. Oh, there is a mixer behind you. Is there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. One second. Okay. All right. So the next example I'm going to give is uh, Left 4 Dead. Um, you're probably all familiar with this title. Um, the Valve team is very, very uh, uh, obsessed with with uh, audio over there. They have a great, great audio team. And uh, they talked about uh, Left 4 Dead a couple years ago um, at a talk I saw over here in the city where they said they were actually doing experiments um, with playtesters, where they would have uh, some playtesters playing with audio and some playtesters playing without audio, uh, just to see how the playtesters would perform in that, in that scenario. And, uh, pretty much every time the, the playtesters who were hearing the audio were always pretty much kicking ass on the ones who didn't hear anything. And that's what they wanted. This is the effect that they wanted. They wanted there to be audio cues that were going to help the, uh, the player get through the game. And if you hear a smoker or you hear a hunter or a boomer somewhere, it's going to help you uh, strategize and prepare to face that particular foe. Um, another uh, thing that they do in, in this game is with the, with the music cues, and you'll hear a music cue before you're going to engage with somebody sometimes. And there are some music cues in here that are just very, very effective in what they do to the, uh, to the overall gameplay as far as pulling the player into it and um, gives you a very cinematic feeling. So uh, without giving, giving anything away, I'm just gonna show you this, uh, this clip um, and, uh, and you'll see who I'm talking about here. If you play. We have guns here! Healing! And don't waste this by getting pounced on or something. Alright, so we had a. You get a tank there, and as soon as you hear that tank music, you know, you start getting chills in your, in the back of your neck and, uh, you know, start uh, getting excited that you know what battle you're in for, right? And, uh, you know, these are another example of getting in early with the design side and deciding how you're going to approach some of these, some of these battles in the game. Um, you know, we don't have to talk about just AAA or uh, indie AAA. We can talk about mobile, too. Uh, and um, I've, I've gotten in early with several mobile developers on, on audio, and it's always worked out for the better. Um, Angry Birds, I think, is a great example because it's kind of the per perfect mobile game. And I don't know if you've had this, this experience, but it certainly happened to me being on BART or being in the bus, uh, and all of a sudden I'm hearing, rah, 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 and I realize somebody has got that Angry Birds game cranked up on their phone, and they're just blasting it. And, uh, it's the kind of game you know people like to play with the sound on. And, and there's a reason for that, because it was well thought out. Uh, Ari, the sound director, uh, audio director on that game, he um, had some time to think about these things and how to personalize and vocalize these animals and these characters to make it really enjoyable for the player. So um, I'm just going to show you a clip. You've all played it, I'm sure. But just uh, you know, bear in mind you know, the, the thought that went into the, uh, the sound here, the background sounds the vocalizations of the characters. musical tag at the end, you know, it's just enough of a breadcrumb that you really want to move on to that next level and get another, get another woohoo and get another little, uh, little musical tag, you know, it's, uh, we, we hear this a lot in the social space about creating sort of um, slot machine sounds as rewards, and you hear that a lot in a lot of the, the um, social games, the popular ones. Um, I think this is a much more clever way of approaching that idea in that you're getting these very, um, 
uh, very uh, well thought out, funny characterizations that make you laugh. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more creative than just a simple slot machine kind of jingle sound. Um, so from a few of my games where we've incorporated audio early on, uh, I'm going to use Raven Sky City, which had a, um, had a, a, a lot of uh, thought gone into it as I worked with a designer. Um, it was about a game, I don't know if you've played it, but it's about a game of uh, 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 a magical sort of city up in the clouds, a uh, city of legend that these characters crash into and they realize they're in this magical city and as they kind of uncover things, they, uh, they are pulling out the vines and uncovering runes and discovering the island there. Uh, we wanted to give it a sense uh, uh, that it was a magical place and uh, it was a good way to do that through music. So what we did was we incorporated a metronome sound system that um, basically the engine would be uh, noting the beats per minute of the underscore and it would note where every quarter note was in that. So whenever one of the sounds played in the game, it would actually trigger on a quarter note. So it would all be in time, all the music, uh, all the little, uh, sounds that you would hear are all musical and they are all in the same key and with the same palette of instruments. So you have a very uh, musical sort of sound design tuned game uh, coming towards you. And uh, along with that, we create a very deep sense of the uh, characters through some very, uh, you know, not extensive dialogue, just a few lines, maybe four or five lines per character that you hear throughout the game, but they're very distinctive and it helps give you a very good sense of the character through, through VO. And it was only two actors we hired and it didn't take a ton of planning. Uh, I mean, when I, when I say we did this whole metronome system and, and, and things like that, I think I talked to the engineer in the morning and he had it done before the afternoon. It was not something that was, you know, a drastic, you know, uh, drain on engineering cycles. We were able to do this pretty quickly and it only took a few conversations and uh, seemed to work out. So here's just a little clip of, of uh, some Raven Sky City. It's on Facebook. That vocalist that's at the beginning, her voice, wow. her voice comes back throughout the entire game as, as you finish quests and whatnot. scale too and we randomize the, the hey, nicely done. Hi. So when you hear this song, as it fades back in, the music will fade back in, and you'll hear that it's all in time. So it all kind of feels like it belongs together. clip you'll see a little bit of a, a building sound where an NPC interacts with a building. When this, uh, well, hey. There's a little Angry Birds joke for you. Uh, when the dragon building starts glowing blue, you'll hear the music playing from it. So it's very subtle, you just hear a little percussion thing happening when, when, the, uh, when that uh, character interacts with that building. And uh, it was a, um, we had sort of two different classes of buildings that were um, these sort of tribal looking buildings with the bones and stuff and they were always handled with percussion and then we had sort of more modern buildings that were uh, let's say a store or a uh, trading post and those always had melodic sort of uh, musical sounds coming from them. Um, another example is in Ravenwood Fair, we had a little content pack called uh, Emmett's uh, Traveling, it was Wailing Emmett's Traveling Jug Band. And basically that little content pack had uh, several NPCs that were all part of the same band. And they were traveling and coming to the fair. And the player could go on quests to uh, unlock each one of these NPCs 
And once they had all of the NPCs, uh, they would play a song together. But if you unlock the banjo player, you click on him and hear him play banjo. You could click on the bass player and hear him play bass. But once you had them all, you click on them all and they will play a song together. So it um, doesn't sound like the most amazing feature in the world, but it was on Facebook and it's kind of a, a pretty fun new incentive that we created uh, in Ravenwood Fair. So uh, here's this little clip to see that. <laughs> So the accordion stopped as the bass. There's the banjo. Just the bass. And they'll venture well come on. all four of them were triggered, then Emmett starts playing his harmonica too. Hey there. Yeah, that was the, they named me after the bass playing dog in that little section. Uh, so, um, you know, a, another little fun feature that we put in and really helped incentivize the, incentivize the players to get all the characters. And there was actually another, you could also go on a quest to get new um, default music uh, that was played by Emmett's Wailing Band. So if you wanted to change your background theme music, you could go through and, and do that quest as well. So we found lots of ways to incorporate the audio to get the players excited about each, each different content pack. So. Uh, some ways to make it happen. I want to, uh, again, just um, make it clear that uh, these things that I'm talking about don't involve lots of extra money, lots of extra engineer cycles. You can do this with just a little bit of thought at the er early on in, in the uh, design cycle. You can, uh, you know, um, I think it's, uh, if you don't have an audio director in-house or an audio person in-house and you're working with a contractor, it never hurts to just get a hold of that person early in the process. Um, it doesn't cost you anything extra to call them a month, uh, three months before the project's due than, rather than two weeks before the project is due. Um, you're probably going to get a better result and you're probably going to have somebody um, more invested in your project if you call them up three months out and say, you know, I've got this game, it's happening on an island, there's sharks, but there's also hula contests. I don't know, I'm thinking about some music. Uh, just start thinking about it, see what we come up with, you know. Um, that's not going to cost you anything extra, just to kind of put that in their, in their head, plant that seed, and, and see what happens. And, you know, if you want to go another step further, just add another, uh, add another um, you know, uh, uh, version of, of uh, iterative version of, of the music. You know, say, hey, let's have another version uh, a month and a half out, and then uh, see where you're going with this, you know. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of extra time or money to start thinking about this. And, Honestly, in the design cycle, you're going to have a lot more time to think about this stuff early on than you are a week before your shipping or two weeks before your shipping your game. Um, everyone's going to be a lot more chill thinking about this early, and you're going to have be better results if you get this uh, get this in the mind of, of your audio uh, contractor early on. Um, and uh, you know, a good audio person is going to really appreciate you coming to them, and like I say, they're going to be more invested in that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, oh, and then I mentioned re references. It's always great if you can give some kind of reference to an audio person. You don't have to speak music, but if you can just point to a couple of YouTube clips or say, I really like this level in Final Fantasy, or I really like, you know, this scene in Star Wars, uh, you know, you can just kind of give them some hints like that and say, I like what the bass drum does here, or I kind of like that high violin thing here. Those are kind of things that really will help help an audio person, you know, get to the place that you're both trying to find. And when you do find that place that you're both on the same page, it's really a, a wonderful thing and you both feel energized by it. So, I think I'm at the end here and looking for questions if you have any. Yeah? So, in the clips that you were showing, uh, I mean, this was the Facebook Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the fact that you didn't use voice as part of that, was that a financial thing or was that? That was just resources on, the, you know, you can't have that much, uh, you know, that can't, can't have that many audio clips uh, in, in a Flash game, otherwise it'll, it'll just bog the whole game down. So we could only have actually, you know, I think each character had five or six lines of dialogue that they actually could say, but there's so many of those pop-up clips that come up and give the player information 
that to, to put them all in audio form would just bog down a Flash game. Yeah. Right, right. Some, you can do that in a game that has bigger resources, but you know, when you're working in the Flash format, you you have uh, you just have the limited you know because every time that game loads up, it has to load up all those characters. And if you have a Facebook game that takes five minutes to load up, it's not going to be very popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What am I looking for to hear from a designer? Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, I like to to um, to kind of have an idea of you know story, characters, tone, um, these sort of things. If you've thought about that sort of thing um, in advance, uh, you know, even even if it's as much as uh, it's like Angry Birds meets Left 4 Dead, you know, if, if, you know, what, whatever. If it's something like that, that that's helpful. Um, and then if you have a musical direction in mind. You know, just pointing to a few references of things that you like, or you know, maybe it's not an entire song you like. Maybe you just like the way the cello sounds in the song. You know, something like that. That's that's um, plenty for for most people to go on. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Right. Uh huh. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what we think a professional can do better. Yeah, right. You're asking what, what the, you know, uh, that's going to vary quite a bit, depending on the level of experience of your audio contractor. Um, generally, they'll, there's a few ways to bill, um, and I can at least give you that. Um, uh, uh, for instance, I will bill um, per minute of music. That's a very common way, and that can, that can be broken down too into, you know, prorated into, you know, 30 seconds or 15 seconds or whatever. Um, so per minute of music is one rate. Uh, per asset is another rate. So if you have five explosion sounds and three applause sounds, you know, that's eight assets altogether. Um, and then for doing things like uh, cutting to a cutscene, cutting sound to a cutscene, usually I'll charge hourly, so there'll be an hourly fee for something like that. Or oftentimes I just get referred, people will ask me, hey, can you just go through our game and identify where we need sounds, and then we'll go from there. And so I create a big spreadsheet for them and go through the entire build and, and do that. And that's an hourly fee too. It's hard to say because I, I, I hate to give you that, but, but um, yeah, I mean, I would say that I would say that it can go, it could go from anywhere from maybe at the very, very low, low end for composers, 250 per minute, which is super low, that's like students, up to 1,000 to 1,500 per minute. So something in that range. And that's usually just a creative fee. That doesn't include extra musicians if you want to have uh, live players. That's a big expense. And usually most mobile or social developers don't use those. Um, and then uh, for per asset rate, Student rate is probably like around 20 bucks an asset up to maybe $75, $80 an asset for, for a professional. And then hourly rate is probably in the range of $75 to $100. Um, but for a student, it can probably be a lot less, maybe 30 an hour or something like that for a student. So it's in that ballpark. You know, and uh, another resource to, if you're looking for, some, for game, uh, contract, game audio contractors, um, if you are afraid to just look on Craigslist or Gama Sutra or something, uh, audiogang.org is an organization that I'm involved with. It's uh, the Game Audio Network Guild, audiogang.org, and um, we often will refer people to, um, to some of our members. It's a paid membership, and it goes there anywhere from students up to professional level. We have an award show every year at GDC at Moscone, and, um, 
and it's you know comprised of students all the way up to the biggest professionals around the world and so uh, we're often help, happy to help people find audio contractors so uh, any other questions no okay great thanks for coming <laughs>